For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon Derehove. Deloitte Director Cordene Oberholzer joins me to discuss government's clean audit strategy. Thank you so much for meeting with me. The Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs concluded in 2009 that local government is in distress and that a comprehensive turnaround is needed. What are the main challenges the department highlighted and what solutions are there to solve these? Shannon, I think that's a particularly difficult question to answer because it's an extremely thick report that they in fact issued. But I think if we can just focus on a couple of the key issues, I think a big one obviously that we see in the media often is around the, the backlogs in service delivery and our inability of municipalities to deliver on those. In many cases, uh, we're sitting with 30 or 40 percent in backlogs of our households not having adequate service delivery. This is largely due also to, in essence, leadership failures. I think when you talk about an organisation in distress and failing, you must start with the leadership. And this is leadership both from a political perspective but also from a management perspective. And that interface between management uh, from an administrative or an executive perspective and our political one is one that is very troublesome in South Africa where the, the lines get blurred, politicians often interfere in what management should be doing, they often don't restrict themselves to being an oversight mechanism and get involved in the day-to-day -day running of municipalities, for something for which they often do not have the skills. I think then we just generally have a lack of skills. Um, unfortunately in our municipalities there is such a shortage of scarce skills when it comes to finance, engineering and the like technical skills is very difficult to attract to them. So that is certainly another challenge that we have. I think fraud and corruption is well documented. The fact is that that remains a huge issue and it's not just one of wastage, it's one that has a direct bearing on service delivery. If a contract gets awarded to a contractor that cannot deal with it, um, that has a direct bearing on our infrastructure, on decaying roads, on houses that fall apart, etc. So all of those are, are key issues that were highlighted by the department themselves. I think when it comes to solutions that's a particularly difficult question again to answer. I think firstly one of my key challenges that, that I see government is facing with is that too often they are trying to fix a broken arm with a band-aid. What we need here essentially is a much more comprehensive, deep-seated, elaborate intervention. The, the sort of interventions that we have seen is, is something that has been problematic and something that has not yielded the sort of results um, that, that we're looking for. So in essence what we are saying is you need to address at least five key issues if you want to solve this problem. The first three of those relate to the people. I think in the first place you need to start by recruiting, uh, retaining and developing the best possible talent that you can. I do not believe that cater deployment should be an excuse to not have an effective and efficient civil service and this is something that we really need to develop as a country. Um, deploying people does not mean that they should not have the minimum competencies. So that to me is the first thing and there must be a much bigger focus on the development of our people. So something like a municipal academy to train our officials is something that we feel strongly about. I think once you have the best possible people, the second one is it's no good to have good people if you don't have performance management. If you're not going to hold people accountable for the fact that they need to perform to a certain benchmark, reach certain milestones, deliverables that they should contract for. So performance management unfortunately in our local government sphere at the moment is not something that is well enforced. I think the third element which is still a people issue is one of culture. I think our municipalities too often see the whole concept of Batu Pele as a poster against the wall, as opposed to a mindset of our people in terms of how do we serve our people. I think then those are the first three people issues and you need to solve those before you can get to the fourth one because too often the focus is on this fourth one where we try and align our systems, our processes, our governance structures, our planning, our infrastructure, each, all of those must be aligned to your, your mandate as a municipality. And then in the last place is one around the finances, both the financial management to have sound practices around that, but also the economic and financial well-being of the municipality. Is it a viable municipality? Is it growing the local economy? Is it creating jobs or is it creating an enabling environment for business to operate in? How can people with higher levels of managerial and technical skills be attracted to run municipalities and municipal services? Aren't municipal managers already amongst the highest paid public servants? 
They certainly are, and in many respects one can, can uh, be critical of, the, of some of the payment levels, especially if you look at the skills levels in some of these instances. But this is not a money issue. The issue here is rather the issue you talked about, how do you attract better skilled people to run municipalities, and I think that is where the answer lies. It is the difficulty to actually have senior people come in and be allowed to run it because they are so constrained when they do get in there. On the one hand, you're sitting with a highly regulated environment with literally thousands of pieces of legislation, policies, um, regulations, directives, circulars, etc., that they need to comply with. So there's a massive focus on just compliance as opposed to performance of the municipality. And that is constraining to your high flyer, talented type of person that want to have the, the ability to make a change. And, and yet when they do come in on the one hand you have this highly regulated environment but on the other hand also the issue of political interference. You have way too much of that quite frankly and you sit with a situation where people get appointed because they are politically accepted rather than technically competent and all of those serve as barriers to entry for good people. I think generally COCTA, the department has, has in their own report spoke about the fact that local government is not seen as an attractive a career path for professionals because of all of these various issues. In South Africa today the average lifespan of a municipal CFO for instance is only 18 months because and, and that is a recipe for disaster. If you're going to change your CFO every 18 months especially in a highly regulated and a complex environment you are in for a nasty surprise in terms of the outcomes mm -hmm. and all of these things really serve as a, as I say a barrier to entry and something that pushes away um, our good and talented professionals. A key contributing factor to service delivery challenges is the deteriorating state of infrastructure in many municipalities. What can this be attributed to? I think there are a number of key factors in this area. The first one is there's no doubt that we've seen a massive exodus of engineering and technical staff from our municipalities. As early as 2005, Alison Lawless has had done research to show that we were sitting with more than a thousand vacancies when it, in local government when it came to engineering and technical staff. We also have the unique dynamic in South Africa that we have something like only half the number of engineers com as compared to doctors and we know we don't have enough doctors. This is a bit of an anomaly because in the rest of both the developed and developing num uh, world you have a similar number of doctors to engineers so it's a bit of a unique situation in South Africa. There's not enough going around and certainly with as earlier pointed out, this not being a particularly attractive environment, uh, we find difficulty in recruiting engineers. But I think secondly, what we've also had to deal with is, is poor planning, uh, partly due to the lack of skills that we have, but also around the poor planning, the fact that we don't have good and operative uh, what we call own M plans, operation and maintenance and preventative maintenance of our infrastructure and this in a case where you're sitting with an aging infrastructure in this, in this country. Mm -hmm. um, at the risk of sounding alarmist, we're actually sitting on a bit of a t ticking time bomb in terms of our infrastructure because it is deteriorating, it is aging and we are increasingly seeing the sort of consequences. Recently COCTA has issued a warning that more than 60 towns in this country you can no longer safely drink the water from your taps. Now that is a situation that is completely the difference from what we used to have. Um, and I think then the, the third element maybe that one can highlight is also the fact that we do not reinvest sufficiently in our infrastructure. In too municip many municipalities where you have financial constraints, the, the, for instance your revenues from electricity would be used to subsidize other operations, to pay salaries, etc., rather than reinvesting in our infrastructure, which is a long-term strategy. Mm -hmm. Typically politicians are only concerned until the next election rather than to think what should be our 20-year plan for our infrastructure. So that sort of short-term approach to planning and to infrastructure maintenance is something that must be addressed as a matter of uh, national priority. A particular concern in the South African context is the poor state of financial management in municipalities, culminating in perennial poor audit outcomes. Can you tell us firstly what constitutes a good outcome and what constitutes a bad outcome? And secondly, whether government is on track to meet the clean audits target by 2014? 
If I can give a short sort of layman's definition of the different kind of audit opinions, I think a lot has been made in the media following the Auditor General's report, but not people don't often understand what it means. Mm -hmm. A clean audit essentially means three things. Firstly, that you had a financially unqualified audit, meaning that your financial statements was a fair reflection of the, the financial position, the performance, the cash flow of a municipality, and that the Auditor General had no specific concerns with regard to your internal control systems, operations, etc. So the first one is, do my f financial statements fairly reflect what is happening? The second issue is for a clean audit is to say that there was no material transgressions of any laws or regulations. In other words, the municipality was compliant with its regulatory framework in which it operates. And then in the third instance, beyond these first two is also what we, what we refer to is that the Auditor General found sufficient evidence that we met uh, and performed in terms of our predetermined objectives. In other words, at the beginning of the year the municipality set out these were, the, these were our objectives for the year, this is how we will measure our, ourselves, at the end of the year there's sufficient evidence that they actually met those things. So those three things combined tells you we've had a clean audit. Um, if we talk about good versus bad, that obviously is the benchmark and the best possible outcome. But unfortunately, of the 283 municipalities, only 13 of them actually achieved that benchmark. Um, but I think one should be fair to also say that where a municipality actually achieves a financially unqualified audit, they're actually doing quite well. That basically, you remember the three things that I just mentioned, that means that first one, they actually achieve that, that the financial statements are found to be a fair reflection of the financial position and performance and cash flow of the municipality. Um, and this might be, but that there might have been instances of certain control weaknesses, or there might have been a transgression of some uh, regulation or law, um, or that there was insufficient evidence that we met our objectives. So in accounting terms purely, is we would still say financially unqualified as you're doing quite well. It's certainly not the benchmark we want to achieve. The others clearly are the ones where we are concerned where there's a qualification. In other words, there's a major issue for the Auditor General or disclaimer. There's so little evidence that they can't even express an opinion on the financials or in fact an adverse opinion, meaning that there's a material misstatement of your position in the financials. So those are the ones that we are trying to stay away from. In terms of your question, are we on track? I don't believe that we are. I mean, we are sitting with a situation, if we take those first two as potentially good ones, we are still sitting that only about 45% of our less than half of our municipalities are achieving that benchmark. So you are sitting with a massive challenge between now and 2014, June of 2014 is less than two years away. Our GRAP accounting standards are extremely complex to apply and we have a dire shortage of skills in this area within the municipalities. So are we on track? No, we are not on track. Are we making progress? I believe we are, but it's slow. Um, and there's certainly a massive effort that will be needed over the next two years if we want to get anywhere close. Government has adopted the concept of the ideal municipality. However, the strategy has seen slow progress. Why do you think this is? The whole idea of an ideal municipality is a term coined or used by the, the late uh, Minister Sichelu Siteka um, within the context of LGTAS or Local Government Turnaround Strategy. Now this was adopted in December of 29 by Cabinet and since we, then we have seen very modest progress I think as you rightly point out. And there are a whole host of reasons for that. As I mentioned earlier, I think the first of that was that even though one should give credit for the fact that this was probably a good plan and the intentions around it were sound, mm -hmm. the difficulty is in execution and that execution capability is not there. So again, we are sitting with even the support that government, whether from a national or provincial perspective, uh, would be giving to municipalities is, is very similar. I used the analogy earlier of trying to put a band-aid on a broken arm. What you need is a great deal more. So what we are saying is that if you really want to implement LGTAS successfully, you need a comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. You need to have a strategy that will probably take at least three years to implement. Any major uh, change intervention where you need to change the way fundamentally an organization works, um, will, they will tell you that it takes you anywhere between three and seven years to bet that down. We cannot simply do it in a short period of time. You need to deploy sufficient resources, both financial and human, 
um, to go and execute on that. You need a mechanism to actually make sure that it works. As I said, skills development critical. There's insufficient skills development. Even though we have minimum competencies coming in, some of which must be uh, in place by the end of December of this year, it's certainly not in place at the moment. So we need a massive national drive around the development of skills. I think given the scarcity of skills, also we need to look at other options such as shared services, such as district-wide intervention to assist municipalities, especially those with low capacity, to also get up to speed. So I think that that's the first issue for me, that, that the interventions and the plan has not been underpinned by a proper execution strategy. I think secondly, we must also appreciate that we are sitting in our local government sphere that is extremely highly regulated. I mentioned earlier there are more than a thousand pieces of legislation, regulations, circulars, directives, etc. that these guys need to comply with. If you couple that with the lack of skills that I've referred to, you're sitting with a situation that it's very difficult to make progress. So we need to have less regulation and more skills essentially within our municipalities. But then I think there needs to be greater accountability as well. We are sitting again with a situation here that lip service is being paid, quite frankly, in terms of our commitment. We are seeing too much political interference in appointments. We are seeing people being deployed without the necessary skills. We are seeing year after year after year of disclaimers without any consequences for the leaders of those. And now we hear again with the AG saying, uh, or following the AG's report, politicians saying there will be consequences, there will be consequences. But we have not really seen that, quite frankly. Um, we will really, I guess, in the next round and when the, the current uh, audits are completed, if there's not been a significant improvement, we'll have to see and hold government accountable to the fact that they committed to, to that level of accountability of their own employees. So all of those things contribute to this lack of progress. But, but I certainly don't want to say that there's no hope and that there's no progress. Yes, there are many red flags. Yes, there, there's a great deal that must still be done. But I think with the right plan, with the right commitment, with the right level of accountability and with the right partnerships that we can in fact turn this around. Thank you for your time. That was Deloitte Director Cordonay Olberholzer discussing government's municipal turnaround strategy.